Hi, I'm Susan Matthews. Welcome to the Subverse, where we journey from the cosmic to the quantum, from forest soundscapes to fragile oceans, from the songs of whales and trees to the secret world of microspecies and microbes, from the stillness of extinction to the flow of music and movement. In this episode, we talk about soundscape ecology, which is the study of sounds, and bioacoustics, which is the study of species-specific vocalizations. I speak with Pooja Choksi, who is a PhD candidate at Columbia University, about her very interesting research on ecological restoration in the central Indian landscape. She uses bioacoustics as a tool to answer questions about biodiversity and land management systems. Her project work is at Manla district just outside the famed Kanha National Park in Madhya Pradesh. Pooja's primary research focuses on understanding the impact of ecological restoration on vegetation, people and wildlife using bioacoustics. She uses non-invasive audio recorders in the dry tropical forests of central India to understand how species are vocalizing and how acoustic activity differs as a function of restoration and management. Pooja's enthusiasm about her work is so contagious that I am going to pay more attention to the soundscapes that surround me. Treading cautiously as we approach this novel and exciting field, tuning into nature may just provide a small piece to the puzzle that is the natural world and how we can live with it. The sounds you hear in this episode are her recordings and from her field sites. Enjoy the episode. Welcome, Pooja. It's such a pleasure to have you with us today. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. Absolutely. We've been in touch from the time I was even conceiving of the podcast. So I'm, I'm so happy that we're finally able to do this interview together. Pooja, we're going to be talking today about soundscape ecology and bioacoustics. And from the little I've read and learned about these fascinating fields is that one, all species have an evolutionary instinct to communicate. And two, prior studies and evidence show that the link between such communication and a species habitat. And three, that making sense of these patterns across a variety of spatial and temporal scales is really crucial. So can you please briefly describe for us these absolutely fascinating fields and how you came to work in these areas? So I completely agree. These are extremely fascinating fields and they've been around, I would say, the use of bioacoustics. People have been using it for decades. And of course, back in the early days of bioacoustics, a lot of scientists, of course, birders, ornithologists, they were all using them to understand species level communication. So often you'd have like a handheld mic, those parabolas, and you'd be listening for a particular species, trying to understand why it communicates the way it communicates. There's been some fascinating work on the calls of certain birds or insects, especially people studying cicadas and how they communicate. And a lot of that has happened the last few decades, and that's mainly because of bioacoustics. And essentially, like you mentioned, the three main things that people are studying, like at species level, just understanding their communication. Two is understanding their communication in relation to their habitat. And third, the sort of spatial temporal patterns. I would say the, the second two, the relationship with the habitat, is a lot of the soundscape ecology work that's been happening, essentially trying to relate why and how biodiversity or like vocalizing species are calling and singing in relation to the sort of quote-unquote quality of their habitat. Is there something that changes about the way, say, just a s simple example, like a oriental magpie robin loves to sing. Does it sing differently in a very highly urbanized patch compared to a rural space? There's a lot of work that none of this is new. A lot of work has been done on this these kind of questions. And lastly, just touching upon the temporal aspect, I feel like bioacoustics is such a useful tool because I remember this one study that actually got me 
really hooked, I would say, because it was in my early days of my PhD. There was a study by Ruth Oliver about a certain species of a bird, a songbird returning to the Arctic to breed. And of course, because of climate change, we're not exactly sure how migration patterns will change, right? It's heavily driven by temperature in the places they migrate from and to. So something that, that she found through her work along with her collaborators was that bioacoustics could be a really, really handy tool to study the songbird because the minute it arrives in the Arctic, in Alaska, it's like singing consistently like because it needs to breed. So they realized it was a great tool to study whether there's been a change in the time of arrival amongst several other things about its vocal activity. So it's, it's a very handy tool. And I also want to emphasize that it's a tool. Everything about this research, that other pieces of research that are going on around the world, they're all driven by the question. And I think sometimes bioacoustics and gets the attention because it's such an interesting tool. But again, the tool is only there to answer your questions about the way a species is behaving. So just wanted to bring it back to it's all about your questions at the end of the day. <laughs> I agree. I think you've put that really well. And we will be speaking more about that in this interview in terms of the question that you're trying to answer. So in terms of your own PhD, how did you start using this tool in your work? Was there something specific that drove that? Yeah, in a way there was. You know, I don't have a background in ornithology. I'm not a master birder. I do enjoy studying plants and, and the growth of vegetation much more. And I actually came to bioacoustics by the way of trying to understand the regeneration of a forest. Just briefly, I study the impact of ecological restoration on people, on the way a forest is growing back, and on wildlife. And to do that, to study wildlife, I'm using bioacoustics. The reason I chose to go with bioacoustics is because we knew a little bit about this tropical dry forest in central India, the, the sort of study system where I ask my questions. We knew a little bit about how people respond to this restoration. We, we know how, say, the charismatic tigers and leopards use these spaces. But there was a bit of a gap in our knowledge about how the other lesser studied species use these restored or unrestored patches. So I actually came to being in this field because I wanted a tool that would allow me to study several species at once. So that's actually my journey to, to this field. <laughs> a very interesting journey. And when you talked about studying several species at the same time, I do understand that one of the theories that you find in this field is the idea of an acoustic niche and that species actually partition resources in the natural world and cover their niche to ensure their survival. So is that something that you've also explored in your own research? I've definitely thought about it. And that's a lot of where some of my future work is going. So essentially, just you explained it beautifully. It's definitely that uh, every species needs space, it needs food, it needs water, it needs resources. And every species are competing for it. And you need to partition them, you need to adjust in this larger picture so that you get your share and the other species are, of course, fending for themselves. And what's interesting is that the acoustic niche hypothesis basically applied the same theory to acoustics. Every species wants to be heard because then its chances of mating would be higher. So one of the leading hypotheses in this field, and there are many that people are testing, one is that did species basically partition the acoustic space? Did one evolve to sing slightly at a lower frequency than the other so that its song or its call would carry to its potential mate? Just an example, of course. Another thing is, did species partition, again, the acoustic space over time? So, you know, is it better to sing very early? Is it better to, you know, be quiet and sing when everybody has stopped? So, again, these are hypotheses that people are testing. And in my work, at currently, there, there are definitely ideas about how I want to test these. But I haven't really embarked on really getting into the species level vocalizations. But the great thing about this data is that 
just exploring it, of course, as I analyze the data with my collaborators, you start noticing these things. And that's what, you know, you kind of jot down your questions, like future re research questions, I have to answer these because there's something going on. So it's definitely on the radar. Great. Thank you, Pooja. I'm just curious to know a little bit about the nitty gritty of bioacoustics, because I do understand that there's a lot of work that has to be done in terms of setting up these audio recorders and ensuring that you collate and sort the data and then have kind of spectrograms and deep learning models. So if you could just sort of for our listeners, if you could just break this down a little bit for us. Yeah, definitely. So like you said, yes, it's a highly data intensive endeavor and essentially what we do. And also at this point, I really want to emphasize this is a huge team effort. I work alongside brilliant collaborators and that's what I think it takes to do some really good research. So I work alongside naturalists who really know the natural history of their birds. I work alongside data scientists. And that's how you create a wonderful, meaningful research outcome, I would say. Okay, so essentially what we do is I've got these recorders that are extremely tiny. I've gone with these tiny audio mats, as they're called. And I, again, I go up in a tree. I put them about two meters above ground, up in a branch somewhere. So I've gotten good at climbing my trees. <laughs> and so I leave it out for a week to 10 days. So a lot of this is based on previous research from different places in the world where we know about 10 days is enough to get a good sample of the, the vocal activity in a location. Once we've got that, think of it as like GBs and GBs of data. However you sample, I don't even sample continuously for those 10 days, but say, you know, I sample one minute in five minutes or something like that, just to get a, a small sample of what's going on. You get all these GBs of data, and essentially <laughs> you've got to start analyzing it to answer your questions. Depending on your questions, you're going to analyze it differently. So for example, the first thing I do is I work with naturalists who are experts at these bird calls. So a small portion of data is manually annotated. We sit down and listen to these recordings and, you know, just put, imagine a matrix of zeros and ones, like, okay, we heard this bird, we heard this insect, yes, it's a one, things like that. So we prepare these manual files. A lot of the ecological analysis about the, say, the bird community, just an example of one of the questions, you know, which are the species in a site and, and how many times are they calling. That kind of stuff can definitely be taken out of the manual analysis and we can understand those, we can answer those questions. The second part that you mentioned, just looking at the machine learning models, there's several out there and the most popular is like the neural network. So I work with a computer scientist this is not my area of expertise. So we work alongside him and he's essentially trying different what they call augmentation techniques. So, you know, manipulate the data a little bit and try and automate the process of species recognition. So you show your model something called training data, and that training data is essentially your manually annotated data saying, yes, there is a red vented bulbul in this in this file, there's something else in this file. And then we show this data to this machine learning model, and then we test it on data that it hasn't seen. And then we look at how accurate it was identifying these species. Another thing that I'm doing in my work is looking at the entire soundscape also. So looking at the acoustic space, how are different species using the acoustic space. So think of it as how much vocal activity is going on. Are lots of birds and insects calling? Are fewer calling? So it's more a quantitative analysis, whereas when you manually annotate, you're looking at the species ID, you know, like bird X called, bird Y called. That's also one of the, the sort of analyses that we do. This is so interesting, Pooja. In fact, when you talked about different bird calls, I do know that there are some birds that mimic others. And I think that in Kanha National Park, you have some real expert mimics. Oh, yes, definitely. I actually love this one species called the Greater Racket-tailed Drongo. 
And it's a beautiful singer. But in addition to that, it is a master mimic. I have heard people tell me that it mimics horns. It can mimic like the car sounds. It mimics everything in addition to even its own kind, other birds. I mean, by itself, I mean, beautiful songs, but the fact that it tries to mimic some of these migrants as well, we still don't know enough about a lot of these species. So yeah, it's definitely a bird you want to hear. <laughs> Wonderful. Now, Pooja, we can actually get to your research question, which is on ecological restoration. So if you could help us understand how you define it and define it specifically in terms of your own project in Madhya Pradesh. I would say ecological restoration is very loosely defined. We would say it could be the, the recovery of native vegetation in a landscape. Unfortunately, nowadays, Restoration is sort of associated with reforestation and afforestation, essentially just putting up trees everywhere. And that's really not what restoration is about. It's not about bringing trees back on every inch of land. I think it's become this misguided sort of notion of what we need to be doing. But anyway, that said, restoration is essentially bringing back native vegetation. It could be restoring grasslands. India is home to some beautiful grasslands. There's amazing work going to like, for example, I was just reading about some work in Bunny, you know, they're bringing back these grasslands that an invasive species took over those patches of land and they're trying to bring the grasses back. And in, in my site, essentially, there's an invasive species called Lantana camara, and it's a shrub that was brought to India about 200 years ago, if I remember correctly, by the British. And in a way, you can say it's naturalized. A lot of species do like this shrub. Tigers and leopards, for example, they, they will use these patches. They're great for cover, you know, so they, they can grow pretty tall and, and you can get hidden in it, uh, literally. There is, of course, a lot of species use it. And of course, there's conservation value in some parts, but it's a huge menace for people. So from my discussions with local communities living in this one district in Madhya Pradesh, I do all my work in Mandla district in unprotected areas. And one thing I heard from all of these places I went to, which eventually became my study sites, was that one, it reduces their visibility. So they're a little afraid, of course, it's natural. I, I would, I'm afraid to get into some of these patches sometimes because you don't know what's hiding underneath. And secondly, when the lantana grows, they said that it hinders the growth of other species that are valuable to them. So just a bit of background, people have forest rights and they're allowed to collect certain amounts of firewood. They're allowed to use non-timber forest product, uh, like collect certain grasses, seeds, collect certain leaves that they can be sold through government tenders often. So it impacts their livelihoods, it impacts their safety, and, and so they sort of request the forest department to remove this shrub that can allow certain native vegetation to grow back. Again, one can argue that lantana in a way is naturalized, so why remove it? And that's why the forest department doesn't remove it everywhere. They remove it in bits and pieces where it would be helpful for people. And they know that those spots are used. They know that they're around villages and they need visibility. So, of course, it's not like a blanket, remove it from everywhere. It's, it's done in bits and pieces. And for me, that's how I define restoration in this landscape, because that's something that, that I was told by a lot of people in the villages that I work in, that for them, that is restoring native vegetation. And it's great. A lot of native grasses are back. A lot of trees that are of interest to them, a livelihood interest, are definitely slowly regenerating. So, yep, it's, it's interesting to see the dynamics post-removal. Thank you. I think you've really painted a wonderful picture in terms of how restoration is being carried out in these areas. We'll be back after a short break. Now, 
now let's enter your project. So what have you been doing now in relation to this restoration? And what is your research question that you've been trying to answer? So I think Pre-COVID, it was a much more glorious <laughs> doctoral research project, which unfortunately got truncated into uh, whatever you can do, get it done. Briefly, in my work, like I said, it quantifies the impact of this lantana removal and slow regeneration for a few years post-removal. How does it impact wildlife? So I, I study the acoustics, the soundscapes. How does it impact people? And that was something that got stalled because of COVID, but I hope to do it this year or next year. Basically, again, go back to those villages and survey households to understand their perceptions of this restoration effort, what they're calling restoration. And third is understand how vegetation grows back when such work happens. So essentially, the way I came to work in these places is that I was trying to understand the impact of restoration. And I wanted to work in Madhya Pradesh because it's an interesting place in terms of understanding land tenure as well as the restoration angle. And I actually had contacted this NGO, local NGO called Foundation for Ecological Security. And they help local communities that wanted lantana removed in certain parts of the forest. They wanted the lantana removed. And what these organizations do is just help them put up these applications to the forest department. I'm still analyzing the data, but definitely where the lantana has been removed. It's again, you know, this is a dry forest. It grows back very slowly. But you definitely see the change in the saplings and seedlings. And you can tell that If these places are maintained in a certain way, it might, these trees, saplings might have a chance. And of course, a lot of the villages, it's in their interest to let it grow because they want these species to come back where once Lantana had sort of crowded out everything else. I can talk about the results with the bioacoustics, for example. So, you know, just from the recordings that I had sent you, if you listen to the sites which I call Restored, where lantana was removed and then forest going back. Of course, you can hear a lot of different birds and there's a lot of insect activity. This was a recording from summer and it's right at the dawn chorus. Everything is awake and everything is calling at once. And you see that the unrestored, this recording I sent you for unrestored, which is essentially forests where lantana has not been cleared. So it's still in the unrestored. You don't really hear a massive difference. And that's something I really wanted to highlight because a lot of the work especially in the realm of restoration, understanding vegetation, regeneration, a lot of the focus uh, sometimes falls on humid tropical forests. Of course, they're a very important biome there. So a lot of studies come from the Western Ghats, a lot of studies come from countries like Indonesia, and to understand what happens you know, when you restore a land. And often in those forests, you can hear these quote-unquote empty soundscapes. So there's not much calling when there's some sort of human disturbance. Of course, all of these things that other studies were quantifying were different. You know, the human disturbance could be selective logging or the human disturbance could be something else. So in that sense, compared to data coming out of these humid forests, my data doesn't show this marked difference. And that's just Again, because my landscape, the the sites are dominated by these generalist birds that can survive in a lot of different kinds of habitats. So that's something that's interesting that I really wanted to point out, because often you'll hear a lot of people talking about these empty forests. There's a disturbance and now they're empty. We don't hear anything. But a lot of that data is, is based on human forests. One thing I would point out in my data is that if you listen to the lantana, the recording from the lantana patches, so just imagine these lantana monocultures, it's just hills and hills of nothing but lantana. They're definitely quieter. So those soundscapes, yes, they definitely are 
emptier than, than the other sites in that, yes, you can hear the occasional parakeets, the white-bellied drongo or a magpie robin. They're dominated by the, the main dispersor, the red vented bulbuls. These birds love lantana fruit and they disperse this plant all over the place. You hear them, but in general, it's much quieter. And you can hear that the activity is really happening at a distance when you hear this recording, because bioacoustics cannot discriminate distances, right? If it can be heard, it's going to be recorded. It almost feels like a lot of the activity in a lot of the lantana data that I collected, it almost feels like it's happening in the neighboring forest patches. And so they're emptier and, and we need to go in and, and, of course, understand whether a lot of that activity was happening within the lantana patch or just further off and we heard birds from there. But yes, there is a difference between these forested patches and these lantana monocultures. And I think this is a great place to also talk about the obvious drawbacks of using bioacoustics. Like I said, you know, no method is 100%. If we were using only human surveys, sometimes you tend to, while you're, you're standing there and looking at the birds and counting them and identifying them, it could be that you've disturbed a patch and sometimes some birds go quiet. Just an example again of one way a traditional method may not also get the complete picture. And of course, if we rely on bioacoustics alone, I pointed with the lantana patch, sometimes you pick up activity from further off and... It's not really happening in the patch you're in, but you can hear it and the recorders recorded it. So definitely it's great to have a combination of methods to answer your question. And again, going back to, to what I said before, bioacoustics is just a tool <laughs> to help you answer these questions. Thank you, Pooja. And I do agree with you on the recordings, especially when you listen to the Lantana monoculture one. It's so clear that there's this almost an eerie quiet. I also just love the way you talk about restoration and these issues. And as you mentioned earlier, it's not just a question of tree planting. And a lot of people just equate restoration with that. And I think you also pointed out the complexity of the issues in terms of, of how to work with competing objectives sometimes, you know, in terms of ensuring that people have access to their livelihoods and to this non-timber forest products. And at the same time, you have these lantana shrubs, which are obviously very good for larger predators to be able to use. So thank you for laying all this out so well and talking about your own research. And I'm sort of curious to hear your views on how you think what you call so clearly as a tool, how this can sort of really help in terms of changing climates as we see with, let's say, the rain in India right now, or even in Europe and other places, temperatures are changing, rain patterns are changing. And how do you think, let's say, bioacoustics can become a tool that we could use in these sort of new frontiers? A lot of scientists are already using this tool. So, for example, there's Dr. Robin Vijayan in uh, I said Tirupati, and they're studying the Shola Sky Islands and they're trying to understand, like many other scientists across the world, they're using the bird's calls or the bird's songs to determine whether a species has arrived late or early, if it's a migrant, you know. So, so that's an obvious impact of climate changing migration patterns. And that said, you know, this kind of work is happening around the world where you can't, it's physically impossible for you as a, as a human to be standing there every morning, maybe up in the mountains or like the, the study I spoke about earlier in the Arctic. It's really difficult. For example, that paper that I just spoke about briefly before, it was literally like there's so much snow how will a scientist be standing there waiting for a bird to arrive, to watch it fly, you know, like sort of arrive on land? So those are great ways people are using this passive acoustic monitoring system or tool to answer these questions of climate change and how the climate is impacting uh, species. I'm not really sure how we're going in terms of understanding an entire ecosystem changing. But like I said, people are using soundscapes as a whole. They're studying the entire soundscape to see whether certain frequency bins become quiet or become extra active. You know, what are the differences? I haven't seen many studies relating that to climate 
per se, but it's definitely, again, it's such a versatile tool that there's a lot we can extract from the data also that it collects because it just covers so much ground. So again, there are great ways that people have combined traditional and novel technology to answer these important questions. Thank you, Pooja. In fact, one thing we didn't really talk about, but I have seen also in your own work, which is the use of spectrograms, which you have written about it before, is it almost being sort of a work of art? And I think that's also sort of very important, I think, to understand patterns, especially when we can't hear those sounds. Yes, certainly. I have to admit, even though I'm a scientist, I'm very romantic about these spectrograms. They're beautiful to observe. So just to explain what it is, uh, essentially you have these audio files, you're transforming them into an image. So it's really funny, even though we're studying sounds, when we analyze the data, yes, we're listening. Of course, we're listening to the data, but we're also seeing the data to analyze it. So, for example, the machine learning models also require these spectrograms. So essentially, they look at it and, and they're essentially doing image analysis, you know, in a way, at least the models that we're working on with collaborators. Also, for example, the manual annotation that the naturalists I work with, they're actually listening to the data, but they're also following the spectrogram because sometimes a faint call may be missed when you're just not paying attention. But, you know, it's definitely going to show up on a spectrogram and you can immediately catch it and be like, OK, this is where bird X was calling or this is where this insect was vocalizing. And we would have missed it if we weren't looking out for it. It's funny that we actually see the data as well as hear it when we analyze it. <laughs> Fantastic. I do agree. They're very beautiful. Now, Pooja, to sort of wrap up, I'd like to hear your views about the field of bioacoustics more generally. And I know that there have been several senior scientists across the Indian Institute of Sciences in India that have worked on bird and insect vocalizations. And I'm curious to know that as an early career scientist, what do you think is the future of bioacoustics research in India? And also, how can it be made more participatory and transparent, especially when we're talking about issues like forest restoration and people's livelihoods? I, I would just love to hear your views on this and then we can wrap up this very interesting conversation. Thank you. So like you mentioned, there are several senior scientists. And I think since we're wrapping up, I would love anybody hearing this, wanting to understand a little more about it. I would say there's Dr. Manjri Jain in Aisar Mohali. She just, she does amazing work on babblers. I just recently also read a popular science article on her work. Some great work happening there. There's Dr. Anand Krishnan, who I'm so grateful for guidance. He's also in one of the ICERs. And there's, of course, Dr. Robin Vijan, who's in ICER Tirupati. His lab is doing amazing work across India on a species level, as well as like understanding soundscapes of different places. And I think that there's definitely one thing that I think, I hope, is in the future of this field because I felt really welcomed as someone who didn't come from a background of avian biology or I had no background in ornithology. And I still felt welcome amongst these expert birders or experts on insect vocalizations. And I hope that in the future of this field in India, there's, uh, we continue these, this collaborative work. For example, I helped found this one research collaboration called Project Dwani with a couple of other scientists. And we're, we're studying landscapes across India. And it's been great to have company as other early career scientists. We all kind of band together and try and make sense of our data and un answer these questions together. And it's also great that a lot of the senior scientists are always available to talk and wonderful. So I hope the future bioacoustics, we, we continue in this collaborative spirit because so much, so many wonderful things come out of it. That said, I think and another thing about making it more participatory is one thing that sort of really exploded through covid was citizen science. So I was part of this larger global project. You know, I just one day I got an email in my inbox that said, are you stuck at home? And do you want to understand how cities are responding to this never ever experienced before lockdown? 
And of course, I jumped on board. I was in Mumbai at my mother's place and I had a recorder with me. I had taken some of my equipment back to Mumbai before the lockdown. And I immediately set out a recorder on my window to, to capture a silent Mumbai. I had never, ever experienced my home, my, my home city this way. And it was fascinating and to see everybody around the world, like putting out their mobile phones, any recorder that you had to capture this change in the soundscape. So in that sense, citizen science, definitely, if you have a mobile phone, if you're interested in what, in species that are audible to humans, you know, so of course, there are species that are inaudible, like bats, and you need to sort of change your sampling rate, and you need to be able to capture that at a different frequency. But if it's it's birds or certain insects that, that are audible to humans, even in like a, a cell phone is enough to capture a vocalization. And, and there are many platforms like Zeno, Canto, there's eBird, there are lots of places where you can send these amazing recordings, audio clips to, and it all helps scientists who have access to this data make more sense of their study species or of their study system. So in that sense, that's one way it's definitely becoming more participatory. I would say there's a huge push in terms of like diversity, inclusivity in academia. And like I said earlier, before I started my research for almost two, two and a half months, I was simply walking around with people from the village, asking them questions. Of course, the people who wanted to engage, you know, not everybody has the time or the mental bandwidth to uh, sit and talk about these issues. But there were some folks who uh, they even took me around the perimeter of what they considered their community forest. They wanted to be part of the study and help me with sampling design and things. And I still, week after week, you know, keep in touch, show them spectrograms, show them something cool that I found in the data, explain to them how the data is analyzed. And, uh, you know, I'm not sure how they would use it. I wish there was an immediate, really useful outcome, but at least there's some sort of agency, I feel, in the way this study was conducted. So in that sense, I, I hope at least that I made my work a little more inclusive and, and there was some participation from the people living around there. But definitely, like you said, it, I hope there's just, I hope it's more and more, you know, I hope we involve more non-scientists into the picture because it just makes the research better. It just makes your, uh, just makes your work so much more meaningful, I think. So that's a very long answer to the question. <laughs> A very long answer, but a very good one, I have to say. And thank you for talking about citizen science. I have seen how it's really exploded in India, in cities and outside cities also. And it's, it's a really great way for people to, I think, explore their environments. And I'm still trying to wrap my head around a silent Mumbai. <laughs> it seems almost impossible. But yeah, but COVID, I think, has rendered lots of things possible that we thought were impossible. So, you know, let's let's see how how it goes in the next year or so. Thank you, Pooja, so much for spending this time with us and talking to us about this amazing work. And we wish you all the best with your research and with everything in the future. Thank you so much, Susan. And I had so much fun chatting with you. Thanks to Pooja Choksi for sharing her thoughts with us. The Subverse is the podcast of Dark and Light, a digital space that chronicles the times we live in and reimagines futures with a focus on science, nature, social justice and culture. We have more information about all our guests and their work in the episode show notes on darkandlight.com. On a programming note, this is the last episode of our first season and we will begin our next season in March 2022. You can follow us on Instagram at Dark and Light Zine. If you like the show, please tell a friend and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. The Subverse is produced for us by Waka Media. So long and thanks for listening. <laughs>